Hey, you're listening to Crash FM. DJ Spinny here filling in for Atomico, currently on a toilet break where he belongs. Firstly, the Game Expo is being held at the Melbourne Exhibition Centre on March 11th and 12th, and your pal Spinny will be there. And I am serious about that, ladies and gentlemen. The link to purchase the tickets is in the video description. And because I was accepted into the Creator Program, if you use that link specifically to purchase the tickets, I received 50% commission from the ticket sales, so I hope to see you all back at the Expo Centre in Melbourne this March. What I plan on doing there is yet to be announced, I'll keep you all posted. DJ Spenny, temporarily on Crash FM. In 2005, Criterion had just completed Burnout Revenge, which had all the winning formulas of the perfect bare-knuckled arcade racer that was almost impossible to put down. It's amazing how much a video game can evolve when you always look for improvements and more money to splash. Like if you compare Burnout, the first one to Revenge, they're barely unrecognizable. It was also the first game Criterion made for the next generation of consoles, releasing an Xbox 360 port, which was a good way for the developers to learn how this new hardware worked. And when it was time to work on another follow-up, they created an open world prototype taking all the circuits from one city in Burnout Revenge and stitched them together to make a map that you can drive around freely to give them ideas what would and wouldn't work before having the necessary technology to fully commit. Codenamed Burnout Next or Burnout 5, again taking inspiration from old school car chase films where cars frequently traded paints including the French Connection and Bullet, they visited cities including Chicago, San Diego and San Francisco where most of these films were set, and the mountain roads of Colorado for the rural parts outside the map. They knew North America was the best setting for an open world map where heavy and aggressive gameplay takes center stage, and took those chunks of city layouts to create their own to get a better idea of the area's geography, shortcut placement, and for the artists to draw up their interpretation of grit and grimy suburban America that matched their cinematic ambitions. Like how the weather effects would look at high speed, or how exciting the action should appear on screen. Welcome to Paradise City, the home of burnout driving. From the winding trails of White Mountain to the grid network of downtown Paradise. The city has miles of open road. Explore everything at your leisure. Since the map has multiple environment types, mountain, urban, city center, and since you move faster than most games available, it transitions between these type of environments better than a lot of other driving based open world maps back in 2008. Need for Speed Undercover try to do the same thing, but I can't even be bothered to compare both games since Burnout Paradise is better in every conceivable way. The least I can say is that EA Black Box were stuck making versions for previous generation systems and releasing a game every year, unlike Criteria. That perfectly sums up the difference between both games. Midnight Club LA, it's pretty good recreating the City of Angels, but it felt like you're still in the city center and amongst the outskirts rather than, I don't know, the Angels National Forest. Not a bad thing, it just puts into perspective how immersive the map in Burnout Paradise was 15 years ago. This game is over 15 years old now. It's a much more free for all experience. I mean, smashing opponents off the road is encouraged, obviously, but apart from the introduction of Paradise City and a couple of tutorials, which I really wish they made skippable. There's no real plot. You have your arrival narrated by Jules de Jong, a trademark for nearly every EA racing game now that I think about it. First car, race, and takedown. In true Burnout fashion, it has all the events that made each title in the series one of the most destructive races in its time, including race, road rage, afterburn, crashes, and new to this game, Stunt Run, where you perform stunts all over the map, including jumps, barrel rolls, and smashing billboards without crashing to reach the target score. And Marked Man, where you basically have to reach the finish line before being totaled by the president's security. What else do they look like? I actually like this event because it's basically road rage with a finish line rather than a time limit, always telling myself, Hunter, not Hunted. Playing the aggressor rather than the defender. But with this map, typically in every event you enter, the game will show you where the finish line is and be like, good luck. All the events are set in the open map without any closed borders, so a bit like Midnight Club, but without the checkpoints. You can see the opponents taking their own routes, and instead of a color highlighted line, you have road signs above the dashboard that slowly push to the middle as you get closer to the intersection, or flashing like an indicator to tell you that this is the fastest way to the finish line. It seems like everything deviates from the norm, like entering events by pressing the brake and accelerate accelerator at the same time. There's no fixed route to the finish line, the roadside navigation, and to quit an event, you just stop the car in its tracks. Or not. Hang on a minute. 
There we go. And nothing feels counterintuitive. Around this time, Crackdown, Test Drive Unlimited, and Mercenaries Playground of Destruction were released, which Criterion were huge fans of. Alex Ward called the latter his GTA with the way you advance through the story mode. It would always be different from another person playing the same game, intentional or not. And as cliched as it sounds, they wanted to bring that sense of freedom into Paradise City. And that's not to say it's perfect. Even by the time I started to familiarize myself with the map, every time I start a new race, I almost always pull the game to work out the quickest route which really cuts the flow. The routine of nearly every single race consists of a few quick takedowns before realizing, wait, where am I supposed to be going again? And because the game doesn't exactly make this whole structure clear, either that or DJ Atomica is so annoying to listen to that I deliberately ignore everything he says, we've all done it. If you want to play with the big boys, you gotta know paradise like they do. Drive and learn people. Atomica and Crash FM. The secret of your success. The first hour of gameplay felt quite repetitive. It felt like whenever a license was upgraded, I was entering the exact same events, reaching the finish line at the exact same spot. And because there's no fast travel and a lot of the events tend to finish around the mountain part of the map where there aren't as many events to enter instantly, you have to painstakingly drive to the other side just to enter another event. So it set a pretty bad first impression compared to something like Burnout 3 Takedown or Revenge where they felt like they crashed through the rusty gates exhaust blazing in comparison. But, to be honest, I have myself to blame for that. As a game reviewer, I have a habit of rushing through one more than I should so I can get a review out sooner than later. I need to be careful with that. Also, I don't want to be hypocritical considering I remember criticizing these games for letting you not only teleport straight to the event, but sometimes start the event from the pause menu. To find events in Burnout Paradise, all you gotta do is drive past a different set of traffic lights. It's that simple. It still sort of feels like you're starting and finishing at the same spots, but every time I start capturing footage, I find a new piece of road on the map I've never driven on. You don't just go to the closest event after completing one. Going out and exploring the map is just as important, because being an open world title, there's more to this game than just winning and crashes. The map is completely littered with shortcuts, billboards, stunt jumps, and cars to unlock. If you see it, shut it down to add it to your car collection. In a way, it's kind of similar to Grand Theft Auto, where exploration and free roaming outside the main events is encouraged, but since there are no pedestrians on the map, just minus the body count. In fact, the cars are empty for good measure, making DJ Atomica the only known human being in Paradise City where the grass is green and the girls are pretty. Isn't that ironic? That's official Atomica advice from Crash FM. Anyway, I digress. Also scattered on the map are drive-throughs that repair your car, change your color, and instantly fill your boost, which do all these things in the snap. Paradise City is the sort of map that's designed so you can keep the throttle held down. It's clear when you're near where you're aiming for, like billboards and shortcuts. They're high-vis color-coded whether or not you've smashed them or not, and there are many unique ways to find them, including parking lots that have multiple ramps on the roof. That I really enjoy doing, even if it's a little tedious to keep driving back onto the roof again for another attempt. Going back to the map size of Paradise City, it was originally going to have farmlands and an airport, but they essentially traded it for more shortcuts and billboards, a denser playground of destruction. When you look at games like Test Drive Unlimited, which has one of the largest maps for a video game I've ever played, it's literally a near 100% recreation of a Hawaiian island. True crime titles, same thing, recreations of real life cities. As impressive as these maps are for their scope, they're not designed for video games, so the other things to do feel like they're slapped onto the map almost randomly, and everything mostly looks the same. A lot of blatant retexturing of buildings and environmental landscape, and need for speed. You know what, even the good ones, all you got were these puny shortcuts that didn't really make a difference, especially with its rubber banding AI. In Burnout Paradise, there's way more going on. There seems to be like a bridge cut off, a shortcut, or a massive jump in nearly every corner and intersection of the map, where occasionally it can be hard to tell what you can and can't drive on, or what direction you're going. It takes some getting used to navigating yourself through the city center in particular, especially if you're going 10 times the speed of sound, and if you hit a wall at the wrong angle, you lose that momentum. They almost got too carried away, but as Jack Griffin said, if a building looked like something players wanted to drive on, why put it in the background?
and you still drive fast, take down opponents, and when you crash, it looks spectacular. The sort of stuff that makes these games masterpieces, and that makes the whole experience in Paradise City stand out from its rivals. And going back to what Alex Ward said, the special part of good open world games is every playthrough is different from the other person playing it. Apart from DLC, there's nothing on the map that says something's locked, it's just hidden, and you need to find it without necessarily telling you what's hidden. Just explore. It speaks volumes of the hard work by the developers to structure the city the way it is. This reflected on what most of the players were actually doing on it. Because after Criterion gathered data on where players were on the map and what they were doing, it was almost the opposite to what the developers expected. 90% of players weren't even entering the events, so were just driving around focused on the social features and preferred to go vertical rather than horizontal. They didn't know their target audience, basically. The uses of post-launch updates nowadays are used to make a very different game, whether it's encouraging the player to keep playing it, like GTA Online with all its heists, or just work the way it should have when it launched in the first place, like Cyberpunk 2077. This is why I never review games on the day of launch, or even the year they're released. More often than not, if there's something wrong with a certain aspect, updates can fix and outdate the video as quickly as a sports game. But in early 2008, Burnout Paradise was one of the main showcases of what upgrading a game can do to transform it into something completely different to its original launch state. Something that can't be done on previous consoles, and for anyone who had access to the internet which was slowly becoming more widespread. And Criterion used this opportunity to tweak the gameplay more suitably to what players were spending the most time doing in Paradise City, including additional events, vehicle types like toy cars, police cars, and motorbikes. With these, it's not as chaotic as driving a car. It doesn't even have a boost system, and the events provided are essentially point-to-point -point time attacks. But they control so well on this shortcut happy map, they're fun in their own right. Additionally, a new area for stunts, a day or night cycle, and a weather system. The latter is mostly visual, it's only fog and haze, which I'm actually not a fan of because all it does is make it harder to see what's ahead. But overall, it was a good deal having all this extra stuff available, some even for free, and it definitely gave players an excuse to keep coming back. Although, since I'm using the original version via backwards compatibility, the links don't work since servers were shut down in 2019, so I can't even show you a lot of the DLC that you need to pay for, which is why I recommend the remastered version if that's what you want, obviously. Just note that I got this copy before the remaster was released, and I usually don't feel compelled to have two versions of the same game. Another big update that fixed one of the biggest criticisms of the whole game, being able to restart an event if you screw up and thank God for that. The developers claimed that it wasn't an option initially because they hated loading times with a passion, probably thanks to their experience with revenge, the loading times in that game were quite slow. Yeah, but you see, driving all the way back is not only a highly tedious thing to do after a couple of attempts when you're already potentially frustrated enough from failing an event, it takes longer to reach back to that point than a simple loading screen where you press a couple of buttons without thinking about it. I honestly don't know what their mindset was when they set it up like this, but again, it's a non-issue thanks to implementing it through updates. I guess after my experience with the predecessors with its rubber banding AI making a lot of the races luck face, I needed a few attempts before eventually winning one. So the thought of going through the same thing and needing to drive back to the start line over and over again sounds like an instant game breaker. I will say, even with the option to restart, I didn't have to do it as many times as I expected, and when the difficulty does increase, there always seems to be another event to enter around the corner of the map, so... Okay, I can sort of understand their initial intention of avoiding loading times. Although it could be because the events in the first hour of gameplay were laughably easy. Which is another reason the game initially felt so repetitive, and undoubtedly took away a lot of the thrill knowing I could make multiple mistakes and literally slow the car down just as I crossed the finish line. I guess looking at the bright side, I get to watch some action-packed crashes while advancing through the career mode without hindrance. But seriously, the first time I ever booted up the game, the first event I entered was a Road Rage one. The target number of cars to take down was 3, and I got 12 without breaking a sweat. Well, the first stunt run, the target score here is 5,000, and that can be accomplished in 
10 seconds. And since you can exit an event at any time once the target is reached, this game feels like it was made for speedrunners. And finally, the Marked Man event has no time limit, so you can literally slow down to make it harder for the Hunter civilians to ram you off the road. Additionally, they don't follow you through the shortcuts, and you can drive through these auto repair joints, which you're more likely to drive through since most Marked Man events are set in the middle of Paradise City. Okay, it did get a little harder just before I upgraded my license beyond Class A. Supposedly like Split Second and Forza Motorsport 4, it has an adaptive AI system where the game becomes harder the more you win and it becomes accustomed to your driving style. So it was only until my license was upgraded to Class B did the difficulty reach the point where I needed to step up my game and not screw up once to win a race. Then you unlock Class A, traffic flow is heavier and cars are really, really fast. It might be the fastest driving game I've ever played. And it's not just the gameplay speed, but the surroundings that complement it, going through shortcuts with all the buildings, clutter and scenery whooshing in a snap. The footage doesn't do it justice. The only other game that could capture this level of adrenaline is F-Zero GX on the Nintendo GameCube. It also helps that, like the rest of the series, it runs in an uninterrupted 60 frames per second and with some of the most detailed graphics of the 7th generation. They made a few minor compromises to maintain that frame rate, like using the same textures for buildings as much as they could without appearing as so during gameplay. Keeping the glow and bloom effects simple, whenever you crash it goes to 30 frames per second, essentially using the gameplay to distract you enough to overlook any shortcuts and made as much time during development to iron out any bugs and glitches before release. Yeah, that's an actual badge they created for the staff to make sure they were left alone to ensure a clean launch for the game. Something all development studios should do. The soundtrack, I almost forgot to talk about this part. Unsurprisingly brilliant. With admittedly a few exceptions, you know the one I mean, even Criterion made fun of themselves for that one. Aside from that, oh, and a lot of original music from the first few games, there's certainly a higher emphasis on the hard rock genre than alternative, like listening to Radio X from GTA San Andreas, with songs and artists from that soundtrack put into this one. Again, it depends on your music taste. Everyone who's a fan of my channel knows that hard rock and heavy metal are my favorite music genres. But looking at it objectively, this soundtrack does match with the grit and grime Paradise City Americana, paying homage to 70 car chase films, where these rocket ships with their powerful boost systems smashing opponents off the road, even when free roaming is just a Sunday drive. There are multiple boost system types based on the car you select, and all of them are taken straight from previous titles, including the afterburn system similar to the first two burnout games called the Speed Boost, where you can't use it until it's full, but if you keep it held down, that'll instantly refill it. That's a nice touch. But obviously, with a lot more ways to increase the boost, it's way easier to fill it to the max compared to the first two games. There's also the aggression boost based off Burnout 3 and Revenge where the meter increases when you take down opponents but only 3 times instead of 4. And speed boost taken from Burnout Dominator which is like the aggression boost but the meter is at its highest but isn't as powerful. Having reviewed the Burnout series in chronological order, almost, all these boost systems were second nature and with the driving mechanics as good as they should be. I mean this is a Burnout game that came out after 3 takedown, it'd be very hard to drop the ball on the driving mechanics. Some some cars are better than others, there was one that I hated so much it made me rage quit the entire game since it seemed to get wrecked every time I went around the corner, but then I realized that the car you select, the boost system installed, actually makes a difference. Some are better for certain events, and it's a very clever way to add variety and pay homage to all the games in the Burnout franchise. Almost as if to say, why go back if you can do everything in Paradise City?
Well, unlike Revenge, where playing it on the same console, it doesn't feel like it's stuck in the sixth generation. It's not 100% identical in taking down opponents. You can't bulldoze through the traffic without getting wrecked or after touch takedown while being wrecked, for example. But you can continue to drive after a wreck known as a drive away, so you're not respawning a few meters back after being wrecked. And as I just demonstrated in my first Road Rage event, taking down opponents is a lot easier than Revenge. I don't know if it was just me, because until until I had the Crash Breaker ability, opponents just refused to get wrecked. There's also an even higher emphasis on stunts. It's amazing how much of an evolution the series has taken in terms of obstacles and being in the air. To go from no jumps and only highways and busy streets to something resembling closer to Hot Wheels or GTA Online. Though it took me a while to master the barrel roll, I wouldn't be surprised if there are people watching this video looking at me like Patrick Starr trying to open the lid on a jar. probably the car I selected. And again, such speed going through shortcuts with multiple variations and sharp edges require a lot of mental reflexes to master. Well, this has been the staple since the first game and they continue to look better every passing title. So I'll let this montage speak for itself. Is this what children think of when they're sitting on the rug playing with their toy cars? Taking a round out of the Fight Night series, I absolutely love the slow motion impact. And the way it gives you a second to think, oh no, this is a big one. Then the chassis gets slowly sucked up by the wall. It was something Criterion wanted to do for a long time, and it was the hardware of the PS3 and Xbox 360 that made it possible. It's only when you're not trying to win an event do you appreciate the detail of a wreck in real time, the window smash, the metal crunching, the sparks, the debris flying off the cars, with the camera angles and motion blur further complementing those improvements. In the predecessors, it used a long vertical collision detection point, so if it flew off, it just bounced off those. Whereas the entire map and all its little creases and sharp edges affect the shape to make it more realistic. Criterion even initially planned on having the cars being able to split in half from too much impact, like a brutality in Mortal Kombat. Unfortunately, the technology wasn't advanced enough to make the effect look convincing. But I think what we got is more than enough. Never will you see another video game with car damage this detailed. There's a reason why you don't see it in most racing games. Their cars are usually licensed and they do not like to have their model smashed up like that, especially when you enter the showtime mode where the aftermath of a good run resembles a cube Mr. Burns has to move in 30 minutes. For a long time I wondered where the showtime events were because next to Road Rage it's the best part of the burnout games. Turns out you trigger them while free roaming on the map at any time. At first I didn't even know how to trigger it properly, I think I did it by accident the first time. Keep in mind I would normally play a game for a few hours before doing my research for a review, that's why it took a really long time to give this mode a proper go. Oh, I see now. You have to press both front trigger buttons at the same time after a crash before you respawn. You can control the rolling car after showcase is triggered. The boost meter basically determines how often you can roll the car and the traffic congestion is suddenly higher. That's a good idea. It reminds me of the insurance fraud activity in the Saints Row series, throwing yourself into as many vehicles as possible while staying with the momentum. Although as you can see at this moment, the car always seemed to just miss the traffic with every bounce, like two magnets of the same side repelling. This mode is better than I expected, very arcade-like, controls well enough, but I still prefer the scripted levels because they were dedicated to that part of the game with the road structure, vehicle placement, and I love watching the replays at the end of every gold medal attempt, but at least it's a different type of crash mode that makes it stand out from the rest of the series. Yeah. 
Setting it in an open world sandbox leaves you more vulnerable to issues including pausing the game to look at the map practically every time you start a new event. It's way too easy for the first few hours. Burnout 3 Takedown and Revenge, I had to force myself to stop playing because they're that good. There are less flaws to distract you from its frenetic action. But keep in mind, I am comparing Burnout Paradise to two of my favorite racing games of all time. I've started to really appreciate Revenge even more throughout the years. And again, that's a massive compliment in itself. When I got past that hurdle of repetitiveness, it eventually becomes everything that I love in a Burnout game. It took its sweet time though. And when you compare Paradise to what it was going up against in the late 2000s, it just seemed to stand taller. It's more physical with the heavy yet tight driving mechanics, the crashes are still highly entertaining, and there's a way better sense of speed. So even if you're doing the same event, your eyes are always glued to the screen, holding onto the car for dear life if there were people inside them. This whole deserted map is an industrial playground, really. So make no mistake, despite its issues, Burnout Paradise is a really, really good game. Fantastic. And after reviewing the Burnout series in chronological order, almost, it's crazy how much it's evolved over the years. It's crazy to think a game that looks, runs, and plays the way it does is 15 years old. It's amazing how much frame rate can make a difference. You put two really good racing games that came out the same year, Burnout Paradise feels more like a came out yesterday. It set a precedent on how updates can transform a game post-release, its online features were highly accessible, and it brings back at least 90% of everything that made the predecessors classics, while being different enough to be a proper sequel that doesn't feel stale. Unfortunately, Alex Ward claims that practically nobody went in to see the presentation of Burnout Paradise at E3, and EA didn't want to put as much money into the game as they could have because they thought the Burnout series didn't have the same level of popularity or cultural relevance as Need for Speed. If that's the case, it makes you wonder why EA gave Criterion more time to work on Burnout Paradise than Black Box did with the Need for Speed titles back then. Aside from a mobile spin-off, and if you don't count the remaster, we haven't seen another Burnout title ever since Paradise released on January 2008. Maybe EA couldn't afford the insurance, or the insurance firm stayed far away from the franchise. Who knows? And after the, well, Need for Speed series was in the gutter by the late 2000s, Criterion half joked jokingly asked to make one themselves, and that resulted in a reboot of Need for Speed Hot Pursuit with a few elements taken from the Burnout franchise including the driving mechanics, takedowns, and an open world map. It was successful enough critically and commercially that Criterion became the lead developer for the series, releasing Most Wanted and Rivals in the early 2010s, before transitioning into a support developer with both Criterion co-founders Alex Ward and Fiona Sperry leaving the studio in 2014 to form a new one. Although when Criterion returned to the series with Need for Speed Unbound in 2022, Kieran Cummins said they'd love to make another Burnout game in the future. Let's say if they did, it'll likely follow the same blueprints as Paradise City given the demand for the open world genre and the number of gameplay opportunities in terms of the number of things you can do in one game. Do I want to see one? Absolutely! Imagine what Criterion can accomplish with ninth generation technology. Larger maps with new events and boost system types while bringing back all the classic ones, have these crashes locked beyond 60 frames per second, and finally achieve the feat of having the cars split in half. Please EA, let Criterion make another Burnout game, even if it's the only one this generation. Thank you guys on Patreon, including Alfredo, Asuntheon, Bribs, Brittleback, Cooper Mann, Darcy McIntosh, David Myers, Eric Barboza, Ian Walker, Indy DM, Maid, Mike Camilli, Malik Ball, Saleh Khaled, Sean, Thomas Rosendahl, USS, VXL, and everyone for watching. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, click the notification bell, support on Patreon, follow on Twitter, Facebook, and Twitch. Thanks again, everyone, and I'll speak to you soon.